Bradley Balco, I've had the privilege of hearing a couple of times previously. We brought him to a couple of our state conferences that took place in Columbia in recent years. Uh, Radley goes on becoming a bigger uh, force in the national scene as the years go by. He is currently blogging about criminal justice, the drug war, and civil liberties for the Washington Post. Previously, he was senior writer and investigative reporter for the Huffington Post, senior editor at Reason Magazine, my favorite magazine, and a policy analyst for the Cato Institute, my favorite institute, uh, specializing in vice and civil liberties issues. He writes on drug policy, police misconduct, <coughs> obesity, uh, alcohol, tobacco, and civil liberties. He also writes on trade and globalization issues and generally on politics and culture. Um, he was a bi-weekly columnist for Fox News at one time. His work has been published in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Playboy, Time Magazine, The Washington Post, The LA Times, uh, Slate, Reason, Worth Magazine, The National Post up in Canada, The Chicago Tribune. Uh, the man is just amazingly prolific. Um, he has uh, authored two books which are relevant to our concerns, The Rise of the Warrior Cop, The Militarization of America's Police Force, and Overkill, The Rise of, a para, the rise of Paramilitary Police Raids in America. He's probably recognized, I think, as the nation's foremost expert on the issues surrounding over-militarization of civilian police and law enforcement. Please welcome Mr. Radley Balco. Thanks, Dan, uh, and thanks to uh, Shelby Cannabis for uh, having me out here. I think I usually talk in Columbia, uh, change of scenery here. Um, hang on, I'm just going to pull up my notes real quick. So I'm going to talk about uh, police militarization uh, in my book. All right. Um, so I normally start this talk by showing a couple scary videos, although since we're talking Missouri, most of you have probably seen the one, uh, the Columbia, Missouri raid. Uh, another one that's uh, pretty dramatic, it shows a police um, shooting of a actual person in a raid in Utah. Um, we didn't set up the, uh, the audio video here, but the Utah raid uh, was done by one of these multi-jurisdictional task forces uh, that we heard about earlier today. Uh, and it was, uh, it's pretty striking that the police knock and announce, uh, but within about five seconds you see them open fire uh, as a man emerges from a bedroom holding a golf club. Um, now, I, this was not the guy the police were actually investigating. They were investigating his roommate uh, on meth, uh, suspected meth dealing. Uh, but this guy, you know, wakes up in the middle of the night to the sound of armed men breaking into his home, runs out with a golf club, uh, and they open fire and kill him. The now, I would submit that, you know, if you are running out of your bedroom holding a golf club uh, because of the sound of armed men breaking into your home, odds are you probably didn't think those were police officers, right? Uh, unless you have a death wish, nobody's going to take on uh, a group of armed raiding cops uh, with a golf club. The, uh, that particular raid, as with lots of other raids, particularly there have been, I think, about a half dozen this year of these uh, drug raids that have ended with fatalities, uh, in every one of these cases, uh, with just a few exceptions over the years. Police inevitably do a review, uh, or perhaps the district attorney does a review, uh, and they inevitably come to the conclusion that A, uh, the police officers uh, did not violate department policy when they conducted this raid, and B, uh, there's also nothing wrong with those policies that weren't violated. Now, if you think about what that conclusion, the only possible conclusion you can draw from those two uh, findings, it's that uh, a police raid for a nonviolent uh, uh, consensual crime that ends up in the death of an innocent person, that, that, is, that the death of an innocent person is a perfectly reasonable outcome uh, from one of those raids, right? I mean, that's the only possible conclusion you can draw. If A, the cops did not violate any policy, and B, there's nothing wrong with those policies, then what you're saying is that this is an acceptable outcome. Um, Obviously, I don't agree, uh, which is why I'm talking to you today. Um, but these raids, if you've seen the Columbia raid, um, the thing I like, the point, the point I always like to make about the Columbia raid, that video, it's extraordinarily violent. The reaction across the, um, the internet was that it was, um, you know, people were angry at what they saw. The Columbia Police Department, their, uh, their uh, email servers crashed. They're, they had to shut down their phones for a while because of uh, all the feedback they were getting on that raid. It actually made international news. Uh, and the one thing I really remember about the, the news coverage was that uh, a couple days after the video went viral, 
uh, Fox News did a segment. Uh, it was Bill O'Reilly was hosting a segment on this raid, uh, and he brought on uh, the noted police militarization <laughs> expert Charles Krauthammer uh, to comment on the video. And Krauthammer said, uh, he said, you know, don't judge this video, don't judge the drug war by what you see in this video. This is, this is an anomaly, these were rogue cops, this is not how the drug war is actually fought. Um, and of course he was 100% wrong. Uh, the only thing that was unusual about that raid is the fact that it was recorded and the video was released to the public. Uh, everything else, the fact that it was conducted at night, the fact that police shot the dog, that, that they weren't aware there's a 10-year-old in the house as the bullets were flying around, um, the forced entry, the relatively light probable cause, uh, to the fact that they didn't even find enough pot in the house to actually charge the guy with a crime because pot had been decriminalized in Colombia. Uh, but none of those things were particularly unusual. The only thing unusual is, is the fact that we actually got to see it, and that was what people were reacting to. Uh, and it was as if, you know, a generation had, had seen for the first time how the drug war was actually being fought on the ground and how literal the drug war metaphor had actually become. Uh, and people were outraged by what they saw, which I think is a healthy thing. Um, it's also why I think all these raids need, need to be uh, recorded and why the, the, the videos themselves need to be part of the public record or, or uh, amenable to open records requests. Um, you know, if you're going to look at that video uh, or any of these other raid videos that we've seen and you're going to defend the tactics that you see in those videos, that's fine, right? If you're going to defend those tactics in public and say this is what we need to fight the drug war, uh, then go ahead and do that, but let's let everybody see those images uh, and let's, let's, you know, put people in a, put the authorities and law enforcement uh, and local government is in, a, in a position where they do have to defend those videos where we're getting a full story of what's actually going on. Um, these raids happen 100 to 150 times per day in the United States. That's a pretty conservative estimate, actually. Uh, and the vast majority of them are for to serve warrants on people who are suspected of nonviolent consensual crimes. Um, so I'm going to talk about how we got here. How did we get to the point where these forced entry tactics, these uh, flash grenades, uh, the, the screaming, the pointing guns at people uh, for drug crimes, how, does it, how do we get to the point where, where we, we're comfortable with that happening as often as it does? Um, a lot of you have probably heard of the term, uh, we're gonna go back way, way back here. So a lot of you have probably heard of the term posse comitatus. Um, it, uh, I think it's, it, it's commonly misused today and a little bit misunderstood. It goes back to a law that was passed shortly after the Civil War uh, that uh, it prevented the the prevented local law enforcement officials from enlisting or enlisting is not the right word sort of recruiting members active duty members of the military to perform sort of domestic day to day law enforcement um, it did not prevent the president or the congress from using the military uh, for domestic law enforcement uh, which is how it's commonly uh, used or I guess sort of misunderstood. <laughs> However, uh, despite sort of the historical origins of the law, and it does have some, some racially questionable origins, uh, it was passed by, or introduced by a, a um, congressman from Kentucky after Reconstruction who was tired of having the federal government run you know, the governments of these southern states. Uh, it did also, though, represent, it does represent a, uh, a tradition that we have in this country of keeping the military separate from domestic law enforcement. Uh, and there's a reason for that, well, several very good reasons. Uh, the first is the two have very different functions, right? The military's job is to annihilate a foreign enemy. It's to, a soldier's job is basically to kill people and break things. Uh, a police officer's job is to keep the peace, uh, is to protect our constitutional rights, uh, to protect and serve, if you want to borrow the motto from the LAPD. These are two very, very different functions. Uh, Norm Stamper, the former police chief, chief from Seattle, uh, who I interviewed for the book, put it this way. He said, a soldier's job is to follow orders, a police officer's job is to make decisions. Again, two very fundamentally different missions. Um, it's dangerous to conflate the two because they, the, the, the skill sets that it takes for each job are not compatible. Uh, unfortunately, our politicians don't seem to understand that, stand this. They believe, uh, seem to believe that because both occupations require um, carrying a gun and using force, uh, that they're basically sort of the same type of, of, of job. Um, for most of our history, we've done a pretty good job of keeping the military out of domestic law enforcement. There have been a few exceptions. Um, the most notable one would be Reconstruction, uh, where you actually had the federal government, federal uh, army uh, for a long stretch of time, I believe about a decade, uh, running governments in the former Confederate South. I would argue that that was probably one of the actually not probably, was uh, the rare justified use of the military uh, in that particular instance. That's also a once in our country's history sort of exception, hopefully. Um, but, you know, the military has temporarily been brought up over the years to do some domestic law enforcement when, you know, you have an insurrection or some sort of civil uprising. But it's always been temporary, uh, and once the disturbance is taken care of, and, and even then I think, you know, 
there are questions about when that's appropriate, uh, the military has been sort of, the, the military personnel have been dispatched back to their uh, military units. Um, the, there was one time, I guess probably in the last generation or two, that uh, we came very dangerously close to breaching this kind of tradition, and that was during the drug war uh, hysteria of the early 1980s. Uh, when members, uh, leaders of both parties, along with the, the Reagan administration, actually wanted to bring the military in active duty troops to fight the drug war. They wanted Marines marching up and down streets and doing drug raids, making arrests. Uh, they wanted, you know, the Navy to be intercepting boats and doing drug searches. Um, it's one of the few really terrible drug war ideas in the 1980s that didn't get passed into law. Uh, and the main reason, actually, and I think this is a healthy thing, is was, was opposition from the military. Uh, the military, I think, one, the military doesn't like to get involved in, in, in uh, you know, sure loser uh, uh, campaigns, and I think even the military understands that the drug war is a, a definite loser. Mm -hmm. uh, but also the military, uh, I think, has a particularly higher up than the military, have a healthy understanding of this separation uh, between uh, police uh, and military. Um, I'll just read you a quote from Marine Major General Thomas Olstead, who was testifying before Congress in 1986. These were hearings uh, basically on this question of, of should we bring the military in to fight the drug war. And Olstead, he was the number three guy at the Pentagon at the time, said, one of America's greatest strengths is that the military is responsive to civilian authority and that we do not allow the Army, Navy, the Marines, and the Air Force to be a police force. History is replete with countries that allowed that to happen. Disaster is the result. Um, and I think Olstead's testimony went a long way, uh, along with actually support, surprisingly, from Caspar Weinberger to uh, uh, dissuade uh, Congress from this really uh, terrible idea. Um, so we've done a good job of keeping the military out of domestic law enforcement, and it's a tradition that goes back to sort of pr to colonial times when the uh, British put uh, active duty troops in the streets of Boston to, for to enforce the tax and import laws. Um, the the animosity and anger that, that built up between the citizens of Boston and the British troops, uh, you know, it spoiled or spilled over into violence eventually with the Boston Massacre, which of course is one of the precipitants of the American Revolution. But I think it was the, that memory of, of, of having sh troops stationed uh, within the citizenry uh, in, a, in a city, you know, walking up and down the streets, marching up and down the streets, really stuck with the founders. And I think it's the reason, well, there's historical evidence, it's the reason why we have the Fourth Amendment. Mm -hmm. Uh, I argue in the book it's why we have a Third Amendment, which no one talks about, uh, and you could also argue that the Second and, and the Tenth Amendment are also uh, a product of that memory. Um, so as I say, we've done a good job of keeping the military out of domestic law enforcement. Where we dropped the ball uh, is that we have allowed and even encouraged uh, police officers to increasingly uh, adopt the mindset, the equipment, the tactics, the uniforms, and the gear of soldiers. And, you know, if your concerns about using the military for domestic law enforcement are that a soldier's mindset and weapons and tactics are inappropriate for domestic policing, uh, I would argue that it doesn't matter if it's an actual soldier we're talking about or if it's a police officer who thinks he's a soldier. Uh, it's inappropriate uh, either way. And I think this is where, uh, you know, we've, we've really uh, sort of neglected uh, this tradition. Um, so how did we get here? So there, there are two kind of narratives I want to talk about uh, how we got to the point where we are today. Uh, the first is the rise of the drug war, uh, and the second is the rise of the SWAT team. So let me talk first about the SWAT team. Um, the SWAT team was invented by Daryl Gates, former LAPD uh, chief, uh, when he was a commissioner at LAPD. Um, he was a commissioner in the 60s, and he was, uh, Gates was basically responsible for the department's reaction to the Watts riots uh, in 1965. And the Watts riots were different than any riots we had seen before up until that point. Uh, they weren't confined to one section of the city, despite the name. Uh, they were flaring up sort of all over Los Angeles. There wasn't one incident that really caused the riots. It was a couple generations of animosity that had boiled over uh, between uh, Chief William Parker and uh, the communities of color in Los Angeles. And the tactics were different. Uh, you know, whatever uh, justifications there were for the riots' anger, and there were plenty of justifications for it, uh, the tactics uh, were disturbing to a lot of people. The rioters would, when paramedics would show up to tend to injured and dead people, the rioters would shoot at the paramedics. Then the firefighters would show up to put off fires, rioters would shoot at the firefighters. There was uh, a sense among Gates and people in LAPD that the, the city was ill-equipped to deal with this kind of civil uprising. Of course, this was a time in American history when it was reasonable to think there would be more uprisings of this kind. Uh, so Gates got the idea uh, to, to, that the, he needed a, a overwhelming sort of militaristic response to this kind of what he called urban guerrilla warfare. 
Uh, and so we consulted with Marines at Camp Pendleton nearby and came up with this idea of having a very elite uh, team of police officers who could sort of swoop in uh, and use overwhelming force and violence to defuse these uprisings. Uh, interestingly, he takes this idea to Chief William Parker and uh, the longtime LAPD chief, and Parker shoots him down. Parker says, no, this comes too close to breaching this tradition that we have of keeping the military out of domestic law enforcement. Parker didn't want any part of it. Uh, unfortunately, Parker would die a year and a half later. Uh, Chief William Redden takes over. Gates brings the idea to Redden, who gives him the green light, uh, and now we have our first SWAT team. I'm a little short on time, so I'm, I'll skip the uh, first couple SWAT raids uh, that really kind of vaulted SWAT out of the popular culture. Uh, you can read about them in the book. Uh, but basically, in 1970, we had one SWAT team in the United States. It very, becomes a very popular idea. By 1975, there are 500. Uh, so basically, every decent-sized city in the country has its own SWAT team. Um, however, uh, for the most part, the SWAT teams were, were kept to their this original purpose, what I think is a legitimate purpose. I'm not opposed to SWAT teams. I'm opposed to how they're uh, too often used. Uh, but that was they were used in these emergency sorts of situations where you had lives at immediate risk, where uh, someone was in the process of a hostage taking or an active shooter situation, a bank robbery, a, a, a terrorist situation. It's where you were using overwhelming force and violence to defuse an already violent situation. Uh, and SWAT teams performed very well at, in that function. And that's primarily how they were used up until the 1980s, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, so let's backtrack a little bit and talk about the rise of the drug war. Um, the, ri the modern drug war, what I would call the modern drug war, really begins in 1968 with the presidential campaign uh, with Richard Nixon, who uh, was basically sought to sort of exploit rising crime uh, and the riots that, that people were watching nightly on their televisions. Uh, if you want to be cynical about it and probably more accurate about it, uh, Nixon's strategy was basically to exploit white fear of black crime. Um, he did this in a number of ways, but w one way that I think I talk about in the book that I think is particularly pertinent to today uh, is the no-knock raid. Uh, interestingly, I mean, everyone knows what a no-knock raid is, I'm sure, right? When police sort of break in without knocking and announcing themselves, it violates the centuries-old tradition of the Castle Doctrine, uh, which says, you know, the home should be a place of peace and sanctuary. If you go back even to English common law, uh, there were always, always laws that requiring, required uh, the king's men to knock and announce themselves before breaking into their home. Uh, this idea that you should have a chance to let the police in peacefully and avoid, avoid violence to your person and the destruction of your property. Um, long, long tradition. Uh, Nixon wants to dispel with this tradition uh, for the purpose of fighting the drug war. Uh, the interesting thing is, and I didn't really learn this until I started researching the book, is that a no-knock raid uh, was not something that police were, were, were clamoring for. It wasn't something that criminologists were saying that police needed. Uh, it wasn't anything that really rose organically out of police work. Now, police did still do no-knock raids occasionally, but the way it would go down is that they would have a warrant to serve, they would get to the place where they're going to serve the warrant, and they would hear their suspect, you know, trying to escape, or somebody would see the suspect loading a gun in the window, or they'd hear somebody getting beaten inside, and then they would enter without knocking, and then they would have to justify it after the fact to a judge. What Nixon proposed was to allow the police to apply for a no-knock warrant ahead of time. Uh, and so now the no-knock warrant becomes a policy. It's a, it's a thing, right? You're either for it or against it, uh, and it's a tool. And the way it was marketed during Nixon's campaign was that this was something that we needed, that our, our police officers needed to sort of take the drug war to the drug dealers, to really sort of stick it to them. And it was this idea that we're, we're so serious about the drug war that we're going to dispense with this centuries-old castle doctrine tradition. Uh, and of course, you know, the people that it was going to be used on were going to primarily be people of color. Um, the fascinating thing about it, as I said, this is not something that rose organically out of policing. The idea actually came from a 28-year-old Senate staffer uh, who had no law enforcement experience, who was recruited to the Nixon campaign uh, to come up with wedge issues that Nixon could use to appeal to white suburban voters. Uh, the guy, Dan, Don Centarelli, uh, still around today, uh, today very much regrets what he did uh, and says that this was you know, one of the biggest mistakes of his career. Uh, but. Uh, given the, the ubiquity of the no knock raid today, uh, its origins I think are pretty interesting, that, and particularly interesting that they're steeped in politics, like much of the drug war, uh, and not actually uh, any sort of necessity. Um, they, the Congress passes two no knock raid bills, one just for Washington, D.C., which the federal government has jurisdiction over, and what's going to become Nixon's sort of test city for his crime policies. The other is, uh, applies to federal agents doing narcotics investigations all over the country. 
D.C. actually refuses to implement the no-knock raid. They had a, a very forward-thinking police chief, Jerry Wilson, uh, who mm -hmm. thought it was just too violative, too, too aggressive, mm -hmm. uh, and actually didn't think it would work. He thought it would uh, create too many, way more problems than it would solve. Um, interestingly, crime will actually go down in D.C. during Wilson's tenure while it goes up across the rest of the country. Um, on the federal level, it's very different. Federal, federal agents start using the no-knock raid left and right. They're kicking down doors all over the place. Uh, they're, they're raiding uh, the wrong house. They're raiding houses without warrants. People are getting shot. Uh, people are getting killed. Um, <clears throat> and a very fascinating thing then happens. Congress actually holds hearings, uh, and they bring in the victims of these no-knock raids that these federal agents were carrying out. Victims testify, and people are, they're, they're horrible stories. Uh, and Congress actually repeals both of these bills in 1976. Um, this is something I, I was found particularly fascinating while I was researching the book. Is that, you know, after, you know, living through, you know, the '90s and the, the early 2000s, uh, there was actually it was fascinating to learn there was actually a period in our history where Congress was capable uh, of some shame and reflection when it came to the drug war, uh, and even admitting perhaps they made a mistake uh, and, re and repealing a bad law. Um, so the drug war is sort of advancing at the same time, uh, but these two trends, the SWAT team, the drug war, they're moving, they're, they're both sort of rising, uh, but they're moving in par parallel to one another, right? They're not, uh, the SWAT raids are primarily, again, for these emergency type situations. The drug raids, the no-knock drug raids, are being conducted by these federal agents, but they're not SWAT teams, they're guys in like street clothes, basically they're usually undercover cops. Um, and it isn't until the 80s that we see these two, these two trends converge, and it's during the Reagan administration where, uh, again, they really sort of ramp up the drug war, they ramp up the rhetoric, um, and they really want to make the drug war a very real, literal war. Um, Reagan at one point declared drugs a threat to U.S. national security uh, with an executive order. Uh, he compared the drug war to the World War I battle over Dunn. Uh, if any of you know your European history, Verdun was this long, protracted battle that produced three quarters of a million casualties, and it was over the strip of land that was really of no value to either side, uh, and it was basically a, a symbolic victory that had no practical effect for either either army. Uh, I always thought the metaphor was much more apt than Reagan realized at the time. Um, but he also, he wanted to bring in, as I said, the active duty military to fight the drug war, created these joint task forces where drug interdiction teams trained with groups like the Navy SEALs and the Army Rangers. Um, they brought, the, they were successful in bringing the National Guard in to fight the drug war, which they've been doing it ever since. If you live in Northern California, you're regularly going to be buzzed by black, literal black, black helicopters uh, from the National Guard looking for uh, pot growing uh, on your property. Um, the, the, um, where was I going with this? Okay, so, so Reagan uh, merges these two trends. He does it in a couple of ways. First, uh, he starts, he instructs the Pentagon to informally start making surplus military equipment available uh, to police departments across the country. Uh, and this policy is going to be formalized in the 1990s. Today, it's a huge operation. The, uh, the office is in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Uh, has a budget, huge staff. We're talking, you know, tanks, armored personnel carriers, helicopters, grenade launchers, machine guns, stuff that was designed to be used on a battlefield against a foreign army is now being given to police departments across the country for the use on American streets and in American neighborhoods and against American citizens. The other thing Reagan does is he creates a series of federal grants that are tied solely to drug policing. Uh, so you send your cops out to arrest a murderer or rapist. Uh, there's no federal money connected to that. You send them out to arrest, you know, some low-level pot offenders. Uh, there's federal money connected to that. Um, so think about how these two policies play out if you're a small-town sheriff or police chief, right? Uh, you get a bunch of cool stuff from the Pentagon, and so you start a SWAT team because why not, right? Everybody else is doing it. Um, or you can, now, now you've got your SWAT team, now you can keep your SWAT team in mothballs and wait for one of these emergency type situations for which SWAT is appropriate. Or uh, you can start sending your SWAT team out on drug raids and actually generate revenue for your police department. Uh, you can guess which one they chose. Um, not only through these federal grants, but also through uh, asset for, civil asset forfeiture, which as most of you probably know, is tied more to drug cases than any other class of crimes. Uh, and so this is where we really get this vast increase in the number and use of SWAT teams across the country. Uh, I'll get to the numbers in a minute. But I want to talk about the other thing the Reagan administration really do ramps up, and that's the rhetoric of the drug war. There's a concentrated effort uh, in Dan Baum's excellent book, Smoke and Mirrors, highly recommend it, which is kind of a history of the drug war. He talks about this. There was a, a, an explicit 
concentrated effort to dehumanize drug offenders, particularly pot smokers. Reagan decided that pot was going to be the drug they were going to go after because they, they, they assumed that by the time you got to cocaine, you were a lost cause and weren't worth, worth fighting for anymore. <coughs> um, so, they, so they targeted pot offenders especially, and it was an effort to dehumanize them, to paint them as animals and uh, the, as uh, one of uh, Nixon's uh, uh, main drug policy guys put it, the very vermin of humanity. Um, so you get William Bennett, for example, uh, going on Larry King Live and saying he would have no moral qualms about beheading drug dealers on national television. Uh, you get uh, Daryl Gates saying that drug users, not even drug dealers, but drug users should be taken out in the street and shot. Um, this is a position Gates would walk back when his son was arrested for drug possession. <laughs> uh, twice, actually. Um, but you see this today. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the rhetoric filters down. Michael, former mayor Michael Bloomberg, uh, said uh, a couple years ago. It sounds great as a former mayor Bloomberg. Um, uh, said a couple years ago that uh, NYPD is the seventh largest army in the world. Right? Uh, you hear this kind of talk from police and politicians all the time. Um, it has this idea that we are fighting a war, and this certainly has an effect. Uh, on the police officers or the troops, if you will, uh, on the ground and how they see their jobs and how they see re their relationship with the community. Um, so by the late 1970s, there were about 300 SWAT deployments per year across the entire United States, about 300. Uh, by the early 80s, we're up to about 3,000, and by 2005, we're looking at 50,000 SWAT uh, deployments per year in the United States. There haven't been any comprehensive studies since, or, or good sample, sample studies since, but uh, the, the criminologists who did those original studies estimates are somewhere between 80 and 100,000 today, uh, which seems probable given that the same the policies and trend that pushed the numbers originally are still all in place, or only more intense in a lot of cases. Um, I have a few minutes, so I just want to uh, touch on a couple other sort of ground or sort of uh, landmark moments in this, this story. Um, the first, in 1996, California legalizes medical marijuana. And you know, up until that point, uh, the justification for using this kind of force, these SWAT raids for, for drug offenses, was that drug dealers are terrible people, that they're hardened criminals, that they wouldn't think twice before killing a bunch of police officers. Um, and, you know, there are rebuttals to those arguments, but, but at least the government was making that argument, right? They were saying, we have to use this kind of force because of the threat that we're facing. Um, when California legalizes pot in 1996, the Clinton administration responds by sending federal SWAT teams in to raid these pot grows and dispensaries and clinics uh, and smoke shops. Now, uh, these are businesses now, right? They're openly operating. Most of them have business licenses with the state or the local government. Um, the, the hippie mom and pop couple running the smoke shop aren't a threat to pull an AR-15 out from under the counter and murder a bunch of federal agents, right? The only reason to use this kind of force with these particular raids uh, is to send a message. You're making an example of these people because they're openly flouting federal law. And, you know, there's a lot of debate about these raids at the time, but I don't think there was an appreciation of just how dramatic a shift this was in how this kind of force is routinely used in this country. Uh, free, in free societies, we give the government permission to use force to protect us from threats. Um, free societies don't let the government use force to make examples of people and to send political messages. That's something that happens in far less free societies. Um, but yet here it was happening in the United States. It's been happening ever since. Um, and we've become very comfortable with it, frankly. Um, we now see SWAT teams used to, you know, enforce, um, oh man, uh, <laughs> I'm going to leave a lot out. Uh, uh, to enforce, you know, laws uh, uh, against, you know, selling unpasteurized milk products. Uh, you know, there have been SWAT raids on Amish farms and hippie communes because, you know, the FDA warned these people several times and they still openly defy the law. So what do you do? Well, we're going to use violence against them to send a message. Um, again, this is not something we associate with the free society. Um, the other sort of landmark moment is the expansion of SWAT team, what you might call mission creep with SWAT teams. Um, to the point where now uh, there's actually a split in the federal appeals courts uh, about whether uh, it's permissible under the Fourth Amendment to use a SWAT team to enforce regulatory law. Uh, so we're talking about alcohol inspections, there have been SWAT raids uh, for code violations, for instance people who, you know, uh, their grass was too long and they were fighting with the local government about how long their grass was, there was a SWAT raid about that in Texas. Uh, and in fact, uh, two years ago here in St. Louis County, uh, there was a SWAT raid to serve an administrative warrant on some people suspected of white collar crime. Uh, the neighbors complained, the local media went to the St. Louis Police Department and said, what's up with this? Why, why would you send a SWAT team to enforce an administrative warrant? And a spokesman for the St. Louis County Police Department said in St. Louis County now, all warrants are served with SWAT teams regardless of the crime. So we've gone to, we've gone from where this kind of force was used, it's a last resort, a few hundred times a year across the entire country, 
for hostage takings and active shooters and barricades and escaped felons to you know, where this kind of force is now used routinely and in some jurisdictions, and it's not just St. Louis County, it's the default use of force anytime there's a warrant to be served. We've gone from, we use this kind of force to apprehend people who are in the process of committing a violent crime to we now use this kind of force uh, as an investigative tool to serve warrants on people who are still suspected of nonviolent consensual crimes. Um, this is a dramatic shift uh, in the use of this kind of force. It's happened gradually, so we haven't noticed, uh, and there hasn't. So I, I would argue there hasn't been a proper public debate about its appropriateness uh, in a democratic and free society. Um, in my book, I talk about the term police state. I think that term is way overused. I, I think if we lived in a police state, I would have been arrested for writing my book, and you would all probably be arrested for coming to hear me talk today. Um, however, for some people, for people who are on the receiving end of these raids, uh, people whose lives have been ended because of these raids, people who, uh, you know, for, for 15 or 20 years were stopped and frisked every 10 or 15 times they left their house because they were the wrong skin color and lived in the wrong neighborhood, it probably feels a hell of a, a lot like a police state. Uh, and for the rest of us, uh, you know, it uh, would be futile to wait until we actually become a police state to complain about all of this because, of course, by then it'll be too late. Um, thank you for inviting me. And do I have time for questions or did I have too long winded? Okay. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. Yes, in the very back. Do you see any decrease in the militarization of states that have legalized cannabis? Uh, I think it's too early to tell. Uh, I, my my feeling about SWAT teams is that they're like any other federal government agency, uh, which is that they're going to find a reason to exist and a reason to sort of expand their mission. Uh, I would hope that, you know, I mean, given that I, somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of these SWAT raids are for pot, that if we legalize pot, that that will cut a lot of it out. But I also have no uh, illusions about uh, particularly, a, you know, a, a government sort of entity as insistent uh, upon its legitimacy as a SWAT team and, and finding other reasons, you know, to continue to be used. Um, but, you know, you take that away and it becomes more difficult. So I, I do think that that would help. Yeah. Yes. Do you see any kind of solution to this? Like Mission Creek does, you are seeing that. Mm -hmm. like that um, in, in the society that we're currently living in, and how our Congress would impact the laws in the states, how, how Missouri specifically does. Yeah. I mean, I, it's hard to say. I, I, I tend to be pretty cynical. Um, you know, there are some policies that we could pass tomorrow that would take care of a lot of this problem. For example, if I could, if I could write one law, or, or ask St. Louis, for example, to write one law um, to address this issue, it would be the police can only use force entry into a private residence uh, if they have, you know, probable cause that someone's in the process of committing a crime, violent crime, or one will be committed eminently unless unless they force entry. That would eliminate the use of SWAT teams for all these drug offenses. Eliminate, you know, SWAT teams for administrative <laughs> offenses, for regulatory crimes, and and it would limit it to the to the type of situation where that kind of force is appropriate, which is, you know, a, an eminently violent situation or a currently violent situation where you need that kind of force to prevent deaths. Um, but you know. It, finding a uh, city council or legislature with the the, um, the guts to pass a law like that would be difficult because it would be there would be overwhelmingly opposed by law enforcement. It would be very difficult to pass. So you know, I'm uh, I think there are policies that could go a long way, even short of you know drug legalization. Um, obviously, that would be huge. Also, um, however, you know, I will say that I, I I have noticed a lot of promising trends in covering this issue since I don't know the mid 2000s or so. Um, I've noticed the coverage of, of these raids has, has shifted dramatically. When I started writing about this, you'd read a local paper and, and it would, the, the, the article would be very deferential, sometimes to the point of breathlessness uh, to the police. Uh, and now their reporters are asking more questions, they're being more skeptical, they're saying, you know, why is this kind of force appropriate for this kind of crime? Um, even like the comment section to these articles on news sites have, have shifted dramatically. Um, you know, there, there used to be uniformly pro-police. Uh, even in a, in a wrong door raid situation, the, you know, the comments would always be something along the lines of, well, they must have been doing something wrong or the cops wouldn't be there. Um, and now there's a lot more skepticism. Uh, the break, you know, it's probably 50-50 or even probably a little bit in favor of more skepticism toward this kind of force. Um, and I also think the public debate shifted. I mean, you know, part of, part of the problem, or part of the reason I think why I'm optimistic, and this is going to sound odd, is that things are getting worse. Um, you know, for a long time, uh, the only people that were affected by this sort of mass militarization and the, the proliferation of SWAT were powerless communities, basically, people who didn't have a platform. Uh, and I think as, as, you know, the SWAT mission creep is growing, as we're seeing this kind of force used in more and more 
uh, situations, the likelihood of affecting people who do have a platform or people who are part of the uh, political class increases, and that's when you actually start to see uh, some reform when it happens. I mean, it's a political reality, right? Uh, people don't really care about an issue until it hits them directly. So, for example, um, the, the, the first and for a while only state to pass any sort of SWAT reform bill was Maryland, uh, and they passed a SWAT transparency bill. Mm -hmm. it, didn't even it didn't even restrict the use of SWAT teams. All it said was every police department that has a SWAT team has to issue a biannual report on how often you use it, you know, what you found, whether any shots were fired, and so forth. Um, it was opposed by every police agency in the state, but it passed overwhelmingly. And the reason it passed overwhelmingly was because the, 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 the sort of leader of the movement to get the bill passed was a mayor in Maryland who had been wrongly raided by a SWAT team, which killed his two dogs. Um, it's of no coincidence that the only state to pass a SWAT reform bill is also the state uh, where a SWAT raid mistakenly hit a member of the political class. You know, I don't think there's any reason, or there's, there's no reason to doubt that's why it happened. Um, we do have another state, Utah, just passed it. Maryland, actually, the legislature let the bill expire a couple years ago, unfortunately. Uh, Utah has now passed a transparency bill also. There's a fascinating police reform movement going on in Utah right now. Um, so uh, things are getting worse, but I think because they're getting worse, that increases the odds of them getting better. Uh, and uh, I, I think as we see you know, more and more people, uh, one more quick anecdote, because I think it's great. Um, I got a, when my book came out, I got a, a phone call from a senior congressional staffer uh, who wanted me to talk, talk with his boss on, in Congress about police militarization. And he said he was libertarian, his boss was very conservative. He said for a long time he's been trying to get his boss interested in this issue and just had no time for it until uh, his boss, who I, who I mentioned is very conservative, uh, was touring the federal law enforcement training uh, facility, the FLETC facility, and I think it's South Carolina maybe, or Georgia? Uh, Georgia. He was touring the FLETC facility and he saw uh, a bunch of IRS agents training with AR-15s. Um, and so the sight of IRS agents using these guns uh, scared the hell out of this conservative congressman, and now he's very concerned about police militarization. Um, but you know, I mean, as advocates, these are, these are important things to know, right? Uh, you have to tailor your message to your audience. You have to, uh, you know, when I, when I speak at sort of right-leaning groups, I talk about the use of SWAT team. I, I put much more emphasis on the use of SWAT teams for regulatory crimes and the fact that they are going after white-collar criminals. And I think that's kind of how you build coalitions. And so I think, you know, when we do argue about these issues, it is important to sort of recognize um, your, your audience and sort of tailor your message to, that, to, to your audience to get them, you know, to come on board. Maybe one more question. Uh, yes. Um, I am a supporter of the cameras. Um, I, I do think there are some things we have to keep in mind. Um, you know, I, I'm as a journalist, I'm all about uh, public, you know, uh, access to information. Also, uh, but you do run into some problems if you're going to make all this, all these videos. You know, I think all the videos. I think the cameras should be on all the time. I think giving the police officer discretion to turn them off is a bad idea. Cause I've written about lots of cases where video mysteriously goes missing at critical times. Um, so I think you need policies in place to protect privacy of people, you know, police officers in your house. Um, one thing I've heard is from the police agencies that do have them, they're getting flooded with open, record, uh, open records requests from sort of trashy uh, sort of tabloid TV shows and internet sites that want to scan, you know, scour this, these videos for, you know, video that they can exploit in some way. You know, that's a problem. Um, and, you know, the, so we need, proper policies in place. Um, one other policy I think, you know, needs to go with body cameras is what I would call the, uh, it's not my term, but I've borrowed it, the uh, missing video presumption, uh, which is that if video, if there should be video of an incident and the video somehow goes missing or never existed, uh, the court should look at that evidence uh, and presume that it favors the party opposing the police officers, whether it's a civil case or a criminal case. Um, now, that doesn't mean the police can't get over that. You know, if you have lots of eyewitnesses that can testify, you could still get over it. But I do think it's, we need to give the police some sort of incentive to make sure that A, the video happens, and B, that it's preserved properly after the fact. Um, as it is now, um, the courts don't question this. If, if there's video that would vindicate you in a case and it goes missing, the courts say you're basically just out of luck. Um, unless you, you have to basically show you, you have to have evidence that they willingly and knowingly destroyed it. Um, so if they just sort of mistakenly delete it, um, you're out of luck. Uh, and so I think we need to change that. I think the presumption needs to go the other way. Oh, you do. You have the right to photograph and record police in, in as long as they're on duty and in public uh, in every state in the country. And there, there are officers who will tell you you don't and they're wrong. 
Uh, and unfortunately, that does mean you might get arrested and spend a night or two in jail. Um, but you won't be criminally charged, or if you are, it'll be dropped quickly. Uh, you'll probably have a lawsuit at this point because now I think it is pretty much accepted law. Um, but yes, as long as you're not interfering, you know, as long as you're a, a safe distance away, uh, you are allowed to record police officers in public in every state in the country. Um, and I think it's important to get that out because the qualified immunity that police get in these situations that allows them to make illegal arrests without any sort of legal implications or I guess making them civilly liable, uh, relies on the law being sort of unknown at the time or unclear at the time. So there's actually an advantage to us, to people like us, to make sure everybody knows that there, this right exists in every state. Every single court that has ruled on this has ruled that there is a First Amendment right to record police in public. So I think it's a good thing to remember and, and spread the word about. Um, thank you again for inviting me. Yeah, I want to, on that theme, uh, I want to remind remind you that an audio recording is often just as valuable as a video recording and it's easy for all of us. I always carry an audio recorder partly for that reason. If I see, I think I'm going to be stopped, I turn on this recorder before it even happens. The audio alone, I know from many of my cases, the audio alone is often the most valuable part of those recordings. The camera you know, isn't going to be pointed where you want it to be pointed most of the time, but the audio you don't have to point. You can actually audio record your own encounter pretty effectively.